Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Shiloh. Yes, we are happy to be in the house of the Lord. That's right. Amen. It is a cold day. The snow is blowing. It is falling. But we are in the house of the Lord to give him praise. Isn't that right? Um, we just sang hallelujah, which is the highest praise. And God is worthy of our praise. Isn't that right? He has brought us through this week. He has solved some of our problems. Our trials may be still in the, in the forefront, but he has already proclaimed the victory. Isn't that right? That is why we can say that God is worthy of our praise. I am grateful to be here, um, and I would thank the invitation for being here to start off your uh, Black History Month celebration. Um, and I want to give shout out to Pastor Anderson, my good friend. I know he's not doing well, and we want to pray for him. We've been praying for him that he will return to excellent health. We are going to take some moments this morning to speak on grasshopper mentality. Grasshopper mentality. Trust, belief, assurance, confidence, sureness, faith. You see, we all know these terms, but many have yet to really understand the concept. The Webster Dictionary describes faith as the complete acceptance of truth that cannot be demonstrated or proved by logical thought. Hebrews 11 tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. Faith, in great need we pray for it, in awe we talk of it, and in testimony we hear about it, but do we really comprehend it? Can we demonstrate it? Can we move forward in our Christian journey without it? The thing is, at some point we need to understand and experience faith. Why? Because John 3.16 says, Whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Because in Hebrews 11, 6, it says, For he who comes to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Because in John 3, 36, it says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. Because in th Romans 3, 28, therefore we conclude that a man is justifi justified by faith apart from his deeds of the law. So to continue on in this Christian experience, faith must be present. Faith must be growing. Faith can't be stagnant because faith is your connection to God. Faith is the medium through which we experience the impossible. Faith is the vehicle through which no matter the situation, we continue to move forward. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, who is creator of all this world, we bow before you because you are an awesome God. We take this moment, Lord, to humble ourselves before you and bow before your throne of grace so that you can tabernacle with us. 
Father, allow your Holy Spirit to speak through me so that your people may hear a word from you. We praise you for what you're about to do, all that you're going to save, all who is going to hear and feel reju um, rejuvenated because you are God. We thank you, we praise you in your heavenly and precious name. Amen. Let's go back to the dictionary um, and look at that definition again. We notice that faith is the complete acceptance of truth that cannot be proved by logical thought. That is where we find our struggle. In this world, things only make sense if they follow a logical sequence or can be processed through human reasoning. You see, you're taught in school that event A plus event B leads to conclusion C. If it does not follow this logical order, it's not possible or, or logical. So you see, for people to cross a great body of water, there needs to be a boat. This is logical. For bread to fall from the sky, there needs to be a plane flying overhead to drop it. This makes sense. For water to flow from the ro a rock, there needs to be a river. This is reasonable. But with faith, we don't need logic to explain what God can do. You see, the logic of this world can't explain the parting of the Red Sea, but faith can. The logic of this world can't reason manna falling from heaven, but faith can. The logic of this world can't explain water coming from a rock without a river, but faith can. The logic of this world cannot explain where you got the money to pay your bills, but faith can. The logic of this world can't reason how cancer left the body, but faith can. Our logic can't move mountains. Faith does. Our logic of this world can't understand how the boss who was against you is now for you. Faith can. Our logic can't help us on this journey. Faith can. Our limited reasoning can't explain God, but faith can. So it's plain to see that faith plays an important part in our Christian walk. It starts explaining where logic and reason stop making sense. Faith essentially goes where logic and reason can't. Let's turn to uh, Numbers uh, 13, 1 to 2. Numbers 13, and we had a beautiful children's story um, about grasshoppers <laughs> um, and giants. In Numbers... You will, you will find the children of Israel at the promised gate. The Bible says in verses 1 and 2 that the Lord spake to Moses saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving the children of Israel uh, from each tribe of their fathers. You shall send a man, everyone a leader among them. Within, within these verses, <clears throat> God gives, has given a command and a promise, right? First, he gives the command. He says, gather a leader from every tribe and go and spy out the land. Then he makes a promise within this statement saying that he is giving the land to them. I'm going to take some time to emphasize that God said he is giving them the land. This was not tentative. He didn't say may give. He didn't say 
could give, it was a sure statement. It was a statement of completion. The land was theirs. However, it seemed that their only focus was on the command and what they could do. So off they went to spy for 40 days the land. You see, it made sense to them to spy out the land. The command was reasonable, not because the Lord had told them to do it, but because they concluded it was within their ability to do it. Um, it was in their ability to sneak into the promised land and report that what they could see growing there. You see, their logical sequence was complete because the task was possible according to them. Satisfied, they came back. And then we find in verses uh, 26 and 27, now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran and at Kadesh. They brought forth to them all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. They had an opportunity to view the promised land. They had an opportunity to experience all that God had in store for them. However, Instead of reflecting on the promise that God was giving them the land, they started highlighting the obstacles. The attainment of the blessing seemed impossible for them. You see in here, we see that in verses uh, 28, we see the doubt creeping in. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and huge. Moreover, we are, saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the mountains and the Canaanites dwell by the sea along the Jordan. Somehow, somewhere in those 40 days of spying, they had forgotten the statement of promise, the statement of certainty that the land was given to them before they left. There was a disconnect from God, what God told them in the beginning and what they thought was possible. What business of it was theirs to decide whether or not they could overtake the city? Did, that, did they not remember who brought them out of the land of Egypt? Did they not remember who fed them in the wilderness? Did they not remember who was in, with them as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night? Their fate was lacking because they forgot. They had forgotten how God had led them in the past and could not trust them with their future to move forward. When God shares his vision for our lives, we often pay attention to what we think is possible. We only love our neighbors because loving our enemies is too hard. We only talk about building a full service church um, building, but actually doing it is too hard. We only talk about what is in our power to do and tell God that the rest is too hard. The truth is, the development and maintenance of faith relies on our past experiences with God. Through our experience, we gain an understanding of who God is which increases our trust in him, and as a result, we develop a relationship with him. With every step forward, we have to remember how God has led us in the past. We have to remember when he blessed us with a job. We have to remember when he saved us from that accident. We have to remember when he healed our sickness. We have to remember when he protected our children. We have to remember when he provided the money. 
We have to remember when he created a way out of no way. We have to remember because our faith, our growth in faith depends on it. This situation that the Israelites were in makes me wonder whether or not they uh, knew the God that they were working with. It makes me think they were quick to forget or didn't share the stories of how they had been led in the past. Just as a reminder, Hebrew 11.6 says, but without faith, it is impossible. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. Why? Because for him who comes to God must believe must have faith, must trust that he is, that he's God, that he's a creator, that he's a healer, that he's a provider, and a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I, I'm going to pause here for a second and ask if there's uh, uh, two people, probably a couple, that would like to demonstrate something for me. Please. Anybody? Don't be shy. It will take all of two minutes. Or we can do really good friends, or we can do... Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we're going to try something. Come up here. Come, come up to the top here. All right, so you guys are familiar with the trust building exercises, right? <laughs> She's already warning, you better not drop me. Um, so uh, let's try that out. Um, so who's going to do the catching? <laughs> oh boy. All right, so whenever you're ready, you can just quickly demonstrate that faith in your partner. Yeah, whenever you're ready. Oh, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you so much. I know some people would not come up here and do that because they don't trust their partner. <laughs> the trust to lean back was based on a knowledge of each other. The past experience with each other and the reliability demonstrated in their past allows them to relax their fears of falling and feel confident that the person will catch them. The reverse is true, you see. We find it harder to trust someone we don't know. This is similar to our relationship with God. The better you know him, the more likely you're going to trust him. We can only do this when we remember our past experiences with him. It must be true that the Israelites forgot that it was God who saved them from the Egyptians. It was God who parted the Red Sea. It was God who caused the water to flow from the rock. It was God who uh, sent manna from heaven. If they had remembered these faith-building exercises, they would have agreed with Caleb and Joshua to go and possess the land. They would have had confidence in forwarding towards their, uh, towards their, to gain their blessing. However, they chose to trust their own understanding and logic about giants in the land. And aren't we just like the Israelites? The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. God shows us the blessing that he has in store for us and he, we want to tell him about the giants in the way. He shows us the career that he has for us and we tell him, oh, we're not capable of doing that. We, he tells us that we need to go to that school, but he, but we tried to tell him that we don't have the money. 
We, we, he shows us that we should wor worship in our own house of worship, but we tell him that we don't have enough people to fill it. He tells, him, tells us that our salvation is ours, but we can't really reach it. Silly grasshoppers. That, those are the tricks of the devil. This type of thinking is part of grasshopper mentality. We believe we're too small, too insignificant, too weak to possess the blessings that God has for us. He's not asking you to do anything. He's giving it to you. He's not asking you to orchestrate a plan. He's already prepared the way. He's not asking you to remove the obstacles. He's already cleared the path. Let's not be like the Israelites with grasshopper mentality where our limited logic and understanding um, is the be all and end all of our life situations. The Israelites forgot it was God who saved them from the Is Israelite, I mean the Egyptians, who parted the Red Sea, who brought water from the rock. God holds the world in his hands. If he wants us, if he wants you to receive blessings every single day, the only person that can stop him is you. Our talk of faith is often empty <clears throat> because we're not willing to act on our belief. Faith constitutes the ability for us to act on our belief in God. You can believe that God exists, but faith brings that belief into reality. Faith allows you to step when you're not sure of the next step to move when you cannot see the way. We are better able to act on our faith when we trust in the character and ability of our almighty God. The faith of the Israelites was empty because they were not willing to act on their belief in God. Out of the 12 spies that were sent, Ellen G. White says in Patriarchs and Prophets that the two Two of the spies enlarge upon the difficulties, except for two of the spies, um, they enlarge upon the difficulties and dangers that laid before him them. Two, through their unbelief, um, though th through their unbelief, they started to change the minds of the people. Parenthetically, I'd like to just stop here for a second. It seems odd to me that these leaders were able to change minds so easily. I would have assumed that they understood that God was giving them the land. They had the opportunity to see the blessings that the land had to offer. So why were they so quick to doubt the power of God? Why when they had been chosen to lead, did they choose to discourage? They knew that God was able. They knew that he was capable of doing exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. They knew that they were his children. So why did they let their human logic tell them what was possible? Why did they let somebody else's reasoning decide their victory or defeat? Are we not the same way? Many of us are in leadership positions and causing individuals to doubt the awesome power of God. As leaders, we talk about the blessings of God that he has in store, but you really don't believe or act on it. It is these leaders that cast, cast doubt and prevent us from building bigger churches. These leaders play up the difficulty and hinder us from reaching new souls. It is these leaders who prevent the church from reaching the promised land. We also have these people in our personal lives. These are individuals who are always presenting negative and stopping us from reaching our potential. Sometimes they are family members and friends and they don't have an experience with God and fail to understand that God is capable of moving when everyone says stand still. They don't know that God has already created the way even when no one sees a door. 
They think they are protecting you when in reality they're hindering you from possessing all that God has for you. Don't let anyone steal your blessing. And I'm not speaking of constructive criticisms. I'm talking about people who don't know who God is and therefore have no faith in him and in the end don't know that you already have the victory. They have applied their own logic to the situation and come up with the wrong conclusion. Don't let anyone tell you that it is impossible because with faith, with God, all things are possible. Faith is the foundation of things hoped for and the evidence of our victory. We have to be intentional in knowing more, knowing God more closely so that we can discern when people in our lives don't know or more correctly don't understand who he is so they lead us to doubt God and what he can do for us where we can't do for, for ourselves. We don't want to be in a position where we limit God instead of listening. We tell him what is reasonable, what makes sense, and what is logical. In that way, we put him in a box and tell him when he should come out. That's foolishness. Isaiah 55, 8, 9 says, for my ways, or my thoughts, are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways. For as, high, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. God is never left without servants who are willing to testify of his goodness and give witness to the power that is him. Caleb in uh, verse 30 tries to remind the people that there is no war we have to fight. There are no battles to be won because we have won already. Hear what he says. This is so powerful. He says, let us go at once and take possession for we are well able to overcome it. Faith has given Caleb the unction to hope and the evidence of victory. Caleb, I'm sure, was willing to march into Canaan, not because of what he could do, but what, because of what God had already done. Caleb was ready to take over Canaan, not because he had precisely plotted the moment of siege, but because God had already ca correctly calculated the victory. Caleb was ready to possess the fruits that they saw in the land because Caleb knew that the battle was not his, it was the Lord's. Church, the battle is not yours, it's the Lord's. The promise to spare the Israelites from immediate destruction, the Lord promised to spare the Israelites from immediate destruction, but because of their unbelief and cowardice, he could not manifest the power to subdue them, to subdue their enemies. We need to be reminded that when we face giants, and though we may be small like grasshoppers, the battle is not ours, it's the Lord's. So when we get caught up in our own logic and reasoning that allow the giants to get in our way, we have to remember that God wants the best for us. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts I have towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. So the abuse that you're going through, the battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. Your children have left the church. The battle's not yours. It's the Lord's. That problem you're struggling with in your marriage, the battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. Difficulty at school, the battle's not yours. It's the Lord's. That boyfriend that's cheating and mistreating you, the battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. I'm just trying to remind you that giants will come. And they will make you think that you can't possess the blessings that God is giving you. But don't you worry about that because God has already worked it out. Those trials that hinder you from um, entering the promised land. But all you have to do is 
take possession and hold tight because the battle's not yours. It's the Lord's. God sent his son to gain the victory at Calvary, and all you have to do is run with the prize. Despite the fact that Caleb was showing them a way out of their situation, they still moaned and groaned about their inability to take the land. Verses 31, 32, we read that it seemed that they wanted to hold on to that difficulty. They were not interested in overcoming. They were willing to settle outside of the promised land. Verse 33 exemplifies their mentality, one of defeat before the war began. They saw giants in the land and they, we were like grasshoppers in our own sight and so we were in their sight. Let me highlight to you that it was the Israelites who said that they were grasshoppers. We take on our own def definition of who we are and it's often less than what God has created us to be. Their conclusion about the situation was not from God. They accepted their level of ability and forgot that it wasn't about their ability. It was about God's capability. It's apparent that the Israelites had accepted their position and held on to their situation. They acknowledged their predict predicament and didn't let go. Their logic had come to the conclusion, a firmly held decision, that they were not able to possess the promised land. Their blessing was within reach, but they were not willing to stretch out their hand. This is part of the grasshopper mentality. The Israelites were chained to their situation through the lack of faith and their limited reasoning. They were in the wilderness so long that some of the original um, uh, Israelites had left Egypt, who had left Egypt were now gone. Those remaining probably did not connect and have stories of the past experience that God was willing to take them into the unknown. Although God had given them victory time and time again, they wanted to hold on to the fact that they were grasshoppers. They wanted to hold on that they were wanderers and not owners of the land. They wanted to hold on to the fact that by themselves they could take they could not take over, and we do the exact same thing. We hold on to our position, predicament, and particular situation that we're in. Our lack of faith also is a lack of evidence of an almighty God. We don't act on our fa faith. We, when we don't act on our faith, we tell the world that God does not exist, and he is not able. In fact, the nations around the Israelites heard about what God was doing with them, and they were afraid of the Israelites. But his own people didn't trust him. Ellen White says the Canaanites had filled up their measure of iniquity, and the Lord would no longer bear with them. His protection was being removed, and they were easy prey. The enemy had already been defeated, but the Israelites wanted to stay in the wilderness. God had prepared the land, but they were focused on the giants. Remember that faith is our evidence of things unknown and unseen. So if we don't have faith, we will definitely have trouble overcoming giants. We hold on tight to the mess around us because we're comfortable in the mess, even though God is blessings in store. We're familiar with our current state because we're not in control of what happens next. He offers us life, love, and peace, and we're in lacking faith. We hold on to death, hate, hate and destruction. The only way we can change our grasshopper mentality is to let go of these giant, giants and trust, believe, 
and have faith in a great and awesome God. If you're holding onto something that was never intended for you, let it go. If you're holding onto past hurts and pains, let it go. If someone can't treat you right, love you back, and see you worth, let them go. If someone has angered you, let them go. If you're holding on to some thought of evil and revenge, let it go. If you're involved in a wrong relationship or addiction, let it go. If you're holding on a job that no longer meets your expectations or your talents, let it go. If you have a bad attitude, let it go. If you're judging others to make yourself feel better, let it go. If you're stuck in the past and God is trying to take you to a new level with him, let it go. If you're struggling with a healing of a broken relationship, let it go. If you're trying to help someone who won't help themselves, let it go. If you're depressed and stressed, let it go. If there is a particular situation that you're so used to, to handling and uh, by yourself, and God is saying, take your hands off, you need to, let it go. Please understand, giants are no match for the God you serve. I'm going to say that again. Giants are no match for the God that you serve. Giants are no match for the God you serve. The God you serve blew breath and man became a living soul. The God you serve put stars in place. The God you serve parted that Red Sea. The God you serve saved Daniels from a lion's den. The God you serve pulled the Hebrew boys from a fiery furnace. The God you serve caused the sun to stand still. The God you serve turned water into wine. The God you serve healed the lame, the blind, and the deaf. The God you serve created you. The God you serve sent his son to become like us and die so that we can live with him eternally. And we are afraid of giants? To strengthen your faith, you have to know that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So the fear that prevents you from trusting God is from somewhere else. If I truly, truly believe that God can do and will do what he says he can and will do, then my actions need to show it. I need to start walking um, through this life in true, um, as true and with faith. You see, the Israelites needed to act like the promised land was theirs. They needed to pack their bags because God has spoken their victory into existence. He showed them the land that he promised them. He was giving them the land. It was already theirs. There are some things in God's storehouse that is stamped as yours. But because you espouse the grasshopper mentality, you believe that you don't deserve it or you're too small to get it. You see, we're too small to own our own business, achieve the degree that we want, have financial stability, have a loving spouse. Uh, these key things don't just appear. The children had to prepare for war, but God had already given them the victory of the land. Matthew 6, Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and some part, all these things shall be added unto you. Trust, belief, and faith in God is how we're going to overcome our giants. Faith is the foundation of our Christian journey. Without faith, God is a mere story or myth. When the Israelites had realized that they had made a mistake, they tried to go and possess the land. You can read that in Numbers uh, 14. 
The Israelites had taken up the battle on their own, and guess what? They failed. White states that by their signal victory, the enemies of Israel who had awaited with trembling the approach of the mighty hosts were inspired with their confidence to resist them. All the reports they had heard concerning the marvelous things that God had wrought for his people were now regarded as false and they had no cause to fear. We nullify the power of God when we don't trust him. And those looking on believe that we're foolish when we act on only what we think is possible. When we act on our own, we make God look like a myth. However, when we act at his command, it is evidence of a mighty God. Our movement when he speaks is evidence of him, and that is faith. Faith is an extension of your trust and belief because faith requires that we act uh, for what we're asking for, waiting as though it's already accomplished. I was working with one of my clients and we were discussing her journey and she asked me, how, how do I start to believe and have faith in God when I'm going through so much pain? And I said to her, faith doesn't just come all of a sudden. Faith is developed through a relationship and experience with God. Each time a trial comes in your life and you have to face a giant, God brings you to the point that the only thing you can do is depend on him. When you see the various giants slayed over and over, after full dependence on God, you build a knowledge and experience bank with him. Then all of a sudden, when you come to a new giant, a giant, and because a new giant, and because of your past, you no longer trust yourself to slay the giant, but fully trust on God. Now, you know, no matter what it takes or how difficult it may be, you can say like Caleb, let us go up at once and possess the land for we are well able to overcome it. It is important that we believe on him who is the rewarder of those that diligently seek him. We cannot allow ourselves to fall into a grasshopper mentality where we doubt what God can do, where we allow giants to deter us from gaining our blessing, and where we accept and hold on to bad situations we find ourselves in. God has provided and is willing to take care of us if we just believe and have faith. Today, I just want to encourage you that whatever situation you're in, God has already made a way. You just have to seek him. You just have to go to him. You just have to lay all your burdens at his feet and he'll take you right through it. And so I want everyone to stand up and just acknowledge that we serve a mighty and awesome God and that we don't have to carry these burdens by ourselves. We don't have to hold on to issues and pains and hurts because God has already given us the victory. So in your heart, in your own private time, I want you to spend time with God, getting to know him, and develop those faith experiences with him so that you can get rid of that grasshopper mentality. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we are in awe of you. We are definitely um, a little lower than the angels, but you are mindful of us, dear Father God. And so, Lord, we just want to thank you, dear Lord, that you are working with us 
through even the most difficult and treacherous situations, you are still working with us so that we can claim that victory. Lord, you are giving us the land and let us go up and possess it, not because we have the power, but because God, you are God and you have done it already. So as we move out today, let us hold on to the true fact that God is our provider. He is our healer. He is our protector. He is our God with us in every situation. So we give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. In your heavenly precious name I pray. Amen. Please remain standing with us as we sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy Hey. 